In his deeply affecting novel Silence, published in 1969, Shusaku Indo tells a story set near the close of what is known in Japanese history as the Christian century, from mid-16th century to mid-17th century. In the story, two Portuguese priests secretly enter a Japan that is viciously hostile to Christians and Christianity. For decades, the Japanese empire has rooted out Christianity wherever it was hidden by whatever means were effective. Where once Christianity had begun to flourish, in the mid to late 16th century, it was now driven deeply underground, resulting in paranoid and secret pockets of Christians hidden around the country. But because all the Western priests who had brought Christianity to Japan had been driven out of the country or killed, there were essentially no formal elements of the religion left visible. But Indo imagines a story where these two Portuguese priests somehow make their way to Japanese shores and then somehow find one of these secret pockets of Christians. And what they find is that in the absence of the priesthood, the Japanese Christians have developed their own ecclesial structure with some elders to preside over the sacraments of communion and baptism, others to act as mediators in confession and prayer, and still others to tend to the sick and the poor among them. But none of these elders are formally trained, formally ordained, or formally sanctioned. So the question is, is this secret pocket of Christians a church? We might want to immediately jump to yes as the answer. But let's pause and think about how the Catholic Portuguese priests might view it. For the 16th and 17th century Catholic Church, the institutional structure and hierarchy was so entrenched as to be absolutely necessary. So where one found quote-unquote faithful Christians, without the structure and hierarchy of Catholicism, one may not have in fact found the church. What I think we could say, and the reason I've started this lecture with reference to Indo's novel, is that such a secret pocket of Christians who have formed their own structure for church in the absence of any established structures is at the very least a new expression of church. This idea of new expressions of church is a good way for us to return to the question of ecclesiology at the end of this course. If you remember, we spent the first three weeks examining different models and marks for understanding the invisible and visible church. And we looked at the formation of the church as a social institution throughout the period known as Christendom. These were all classical inquiries of ecclesiology. Then, as the course went on, we moved into a more society-based discussion of church traditions and contemporary issues the church faces in 21st century America. We've even verged into ethical discussions over the past couple of weeks, but now we're returning to ecclesiology, and I want to pose the question, is there a future in the church, or is there a church in the future? This is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek sort of question, because I definitely think there is church in our future. But the question of what church looks like moving into the future has been hotly debated at the beginning of the 21st century. A number of factors, sociological, theological, and political, converged at the beginning of the 21st century, resulting in what many thought to be a dramatic shift in the church, even akin to the Great Schism between East and West in 1054 or the Protestant Reformation in the early 1500s. These factors included, but are not limited to, some of the trends we've discussed over the past few weeks. Postmodernism, polarization, technological revolution, etc. The dramatic shift at the beginning of the 21st century went by many names, but we will examine it under two of the most common, the emerging church movement and fresh expressions.
Scholars Eddie Gibbs and Ryan Bolger, in their book Emerging Churches from 2006, provide a good explanation of what this movement is about and why it is hard to define. Emerging churches are not young adult services, Gen X churches, churches within a church, seeker churches, purpose-driven or new paradigm churches, fundamentalist churches, or even evangelical churches. They are a new expression of church. You can hopefully see in this definition the connection to the story from the novel Silence. But you can also see that there are as many anti-definitions here as positive ones. Emerging churches are not a lot of things, but what they are is hard to define. Gibbs and Bulger try to offer a positive definition as well. They identify three core practices of emerging churches in the first decade of the 21st century. Identifying with the life of Jesus, transforming secular space, and a commitment to community as a way of life. These new expressions of church were formed alongside, within, or even entirely separately from traditional expressions of church. And at the end of the 20th century and beginning of the 21st century, these emerging churches and the movement associated with them exploded, especially in North America. Ironically, this explosion of popularity probably contributed to the movement's demise, which was as quick, if not quicker, than its rise. If nothing else, emerging churches rose in reaction to the institutional Christianity and its unwieldy, inflexible, and often harmful organizational structures. The trouble is, when something reactionary becomes popular, it often ends up looking more and more like the thing it reacted against. And that is basically what happened to the most popular emerging churches, like Mars Hill Church, founded by Rob Bell, or to the public persona of Brian McLaren, another of the quote-unquote founders of the emerging church movement. Indeed, as Anthony Bradley pronounced in a 2010 mock obituary to the emerging church movement, after the first decade of the 21st century, books and articles both for and against the emerging church movement essentially ceased to exist. The movement faded more quickly than it rose. Or did it? While it is certainly true that the nomenclature fell out of use, basically no one is touting their church as emerging or emergent anymore. The questions and challenges raised by the movement, though, have continued to pester the church in America and globally. For all the critical accusations that the emerging church movement pandered to postmodernism, acquiesced to culture, or flirted with relativism, the heart of the challenge the emerging church movement posed to traditional churches and church structures had to do with contextualization and mission. As Jensen and Wilhite put it, as the emerging church attempted to become church to the world, it insisted on being contextualized and incarnational to the postmodern condition and culture in which contemporary Christians find both their location and their vocation. In other words, the emerging church movement forced Christians, particularly in traditional church institutions, to examine if and how they were being contextual, incarnational, and missional. And in quite a number of cases, traditional churches had to admit they had lost that focus, as was evidenced by declining church attendance across traditional denominations at the turn of the 21st century. So what was left in the wake of the fading emerging church movement was what Ed Stetzer called a post-emerging clarification in an article for Christianity Today from 2019. Stetzer was speaking exclusively of the evangelical church in America and its reaction to the emerging church movement, but his point is salient for most, if not all, Christian traditions. 
There is a need to clarify the church's beliefs and practices when it comes to mission, and the emerging church movement provided a good opportunity to do that work of clarification and recontextualization. The concept of contextualization provides a perfect segue to discussing the other form of new expression of church that arose at the turn of the 21st century, what has come to be known as fresh expressions. While fresh expressions has become a worldwide movement, its beginnings lie in the UK, and its formal entry onto the ecclesiological scene can be placed firmly in 2004 with the Mission-Shaped Church Report, commissioned by the Church of England and Archbishop at the time, Rowan Williams. Groups and leaders who would be categorized under the heading Fresh Expressions in 2004 had existed and been growing for many years prior. In fact, their growth and effectiveness is what prompted the commissioning of the report. One of the most interesting things about Fresh Expressions that runs contrary to the emerging church movement in America is that the mission-shaped church report in 2004 marked an effort by the established church to both support and enfold these dynamic gatherings. In other words, with the completion of the report, came an official recognition from the Church of England that these new expressions of Christian community were needed and were worth funding. Finances and resources were immediately dedicated to help Fresh Expressions communities to grow and for new ones to be started. For this reason, among others, the Fresh Expressions movement has continued its momentum and influence long past the fading of the emerging church movement. The 2004 report highlighted many of the trends we've discussed already. It lamented the decline in church attendance, and then suggested that if the Church of England was to survive and thrive in the 21st century, fresh expressions of church were needed that helped to create a mixed economy, quote-unquote, of church practice. Let's try to hone in on definitions for each of those ideas. The report defined fresh expressions as new forms of church that emerge within contemporary culture and engage primarily with those who do not go to church. This definition is crucial in a couple of ways. First, it recognizes these fresh expressions as church, properly speaking. Even though they may be groups meeting in a pub, or a shopping mall, or an outdoor amphitheater, and they might consist of folk music, surfing, or even just conversation and a meal, these groups are church. That kind of recognition from the Church of England is both remarkable and a good reason the Fresh Expressions movement has continued to flourish in the UK and now reaches beyond the UK to many parts of the world. Second, that definition rightly places the focus of Fresh Expressions groups on mission, to reach out to people who do not have much of a connection to established church at all. This emphasis on mission might mean an inevitable de-emphasis on doctrine, traditionally understood. But the Church of England seems content to try to hold the center together, despite the need for more doctrinal flexibility among Fresh Expressions groups and leaders. Now, let's try to get a grasp on what is meant by mixed economy of church practice in this context of Fresh Expressions. The term mixed economy was first used by Archbishop Rowan Williams around the time of this crucial Church of England report. He used the term to refer to mutual respect and support demonstrated between fresh expressions of church and inherited or traditional expressions of church. The key idea here is that Archbishop Williams and the Church of England have determined that both these kinds of expressions and the many subsidiary expressions within the broad categories are needed for the church to flourish 
and to reach and serve the world. The mixed economy idea allows for diversity and unity, even celebrates diversity in the context of unity, and by doing so, creates room for continued unity, which is something Protestant churches have struggled with for the past 500 years. So what is the future of the church? Or maybe more to the point, is there a future for the church? Theologian Ephraim Radner provocatively suggested in a lecture in 2015 that there isn't a future for the church, at least not the church as we know it today or as we've known it in history. I would encourage you to check out his 15-minute lecture at this link starting at the 1830 mark, to see what he's talking about. If I take his point that the church will radically change, and perhaps change into something we wouldn't recognize as church, then there is a certain sense in which the challenges and questions of both the emerging church movement and fresh expressions movement do signal a shift in our understanding of church moving into the future. So let me close by pulling on a few threads that have been woven together throughout the last eight weeks. First, I think there is a question of how the church in America and around the world adapts to a rising generation that questions or outright rejects denominationalism. The emerging church movement, more so than fresh expressions, posed this challenge to traditional church structures. The emerging church movement was perhaps weirdly ecumenical, and sometimes paradoxically or inconsistently ecumenical, but it was ecumenical nonetheless. And in rejecting ties to traditional denominations, the emerging church movement tapped into, or perhaps exacerbated, a sense of skepticism toward traditional denominations among especially Gen Xers and Millennials. The growing popularity of non-denominational churches and the growing popularity of denominational churches removing any traditional denominational markers from their public presentations indicate that wrestling with post-denominationalism will continue to be important for the American church in at least the near future. Second, the strong reaction to Enlightenment categories of epistemology, reason, objectivity, truth, and language within the emerging church movement and fresh expressions will continue to fuel conversations about contextualization in mission. As postmodernism gives way to other ideological trends, will churches and church leaders frantically grasp at cherished models and categories inherited from the modern period? Or will they be willing to revisit some pre-modern ideas regarding church practice and entertain the value of new practices? Related to the question of a post-Enlightenment church is the question of a post-Christendom church. As the inherited structures of Christendom continue to deteriorate, and Christians become a decreasing minority in North America, as they already have in Europe, how will the church adapt? A loss of cultural and social power in the church could give way to a more prophetic witness and voice, but not if churches and church leaders put their energy and resources into maintaining that cultural power. So, if the near future of the church lies in a post-denominational, post-enlightenment, post-Christendom context where mission and contextualization become top priorities and doctrinal purity becomes a lesser priority, is there a way for the center to hold? Is there a center we can land in or aim at at all? I don't mean to end these lectures on a skeptical or pessimistic note but I do mean to end on a note of curiosity. New contexts require recontextualization, and the future of the church may not look like the church as we know it. 
As a final resource, I'll give a shout out to Rich Viodas and New Life Fellowship in New York City. As a church, they have developed a set of values that characterize their vision to see lives deeply transformed by Jesus for the sake of the world. That's in their mission statement. To see lives deeply transformed by Jesus for the sake of the world. These motivating values are monasticism, the need for our lives to be oriented around rhythms of prayer, silence, rest, and community, being multiracial, a commitment to emotional and mental health, a theology of sexuality rooted in the biblical metaphor of the church as the bride of Christ, and being missional. You can check out their descriptions of these motivating values on their website. I hope you can see in these values many of the themes and questions we've discussed over this course and how they might start to be worked out contextually in the 21st century. This certainly does not mean every church needs to look like New Life Fellowship. In fact, I'd argue they shouldn't. We need diversity in the contextualization. And this will mean different expressions of core Christian beliefs and practices. As you think about stepping back into your own churches, I hope some of the questions and discussions we've raised in this class will help you think through how to be a faithful follower of Christ in the church long into the future.